welcome everyone to this Network and Connect session, uh, Women in Computational Biology, uh, organized by the ECCB 2020 conference. Uh, we will give you some minutes uh, for people get in, joining the, the session while I, I give some points for the introduction. So first of all, I just want to let you know that this session is, is open and informal, so please, if someone or something in your home requires your attention, just attend it uh, calmly. Um, and then we will try to make it uh, very comfortable without any kind of stress. And we want this a place where everyone can speak openly and, and just to welcome you to share your ideas, your knowledge, your experiences, and help us uh, with this development of the scientific career in, in women in computational biology and, and let people learn more about it. So just to let you know, uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, we will then share this session on the webpage of the BioInfo for Women program. Uh, so please don't share anything confidential um, and then just share your own um, personal and professional uh, points of views uh, as, as you like. So uh, this Network and Connect session uh, is part of the ECCB conference, as I said. It's organized by the BioInfo for Women program, and it's supported by Grifols. Uh, in this session, we want to give the opportunity to share your knowledge, your experience, and the opinion of the participants that I will introduce now. And the main uh, objective is to share different initiatives and actions that are carried out to enhance the role uh, in vivo, yeah? of women in the scientific field. So uh, a first reminder, uh, please mute your microphones until you have to present. And if you are an attendant, just uh, silent your microphone until the open discussion at the end of the session. So the first thing I want to do is to thank the ECCB organization for including uh, the gender point of view in this conference and the organizers of the relative activities. So here we have Natalie Buslon, Eva Ayoza, Eva Navarrete, Alba Jané, and Maria Jose Renenteria as part of the BioInfo for Women program. And now I would like to introduce the speakers that we will have uh, this afternoon. So first of all, uh, we have Londa Schippinger. Um, she's a professor of history of science at the University of Stanford and a director of the EU-US Gender and Innovations uh, in Science, Health and Medicine, Engineering and Environment. Um, then we have Lucia Peixoto, who is a PhD assistant professor at Washington State University in the, uh, and she's a co-chair of the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and also an outreach uh, committee in the International Society for Computational Biology. Uh, then we will have Maria Jose Rementeria, who is the group leader of the social link analytic groups at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center uh, in the Life de Science Department. And then she's also the lead of this BioInfo for Women program uh, that she will introduce. We also have uh, Ana Julia Vélez and Lucy Jiménez uh, from the uh, Women in Bioinf Bioinformatics and Data Science uh, Latin America. Uh, Ana Julia is a postdoctoral researcher at the Un Universidad Nacional de Quilmes, uh, Connecticut, Argentina, and she is the co-organizer of the first Latin American con Congress of these Women in Bioinformatics and Data Science. And Lucy is a master in computational chemistry and part of the Cobo Research Group in Computational Bioorganic Chemistry at the Universidad de los Andes in Colombia. And she's also a co-organizer of this first Latin American Congress. And finally, we have Jenea Adams and Taylor Firby uh, from the uh, Black Women in Computational Biology Network. And Jenea is a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania in the Perlman School of Medicine, Genomics and Computational Biology program. And she's the founder of this Black, uh, Black Women in Computational Biology Network. And Taylor is a PhD student also in computational biology in the Buckler laboratory, laboratory at Cornell University. So thank you all for being here uh, and accepting to participate today. I just want to remind you that the format of the session will be first a 10 minutes presentation for each of you. 
uh, uh, where you will explain your associations, the objectives, the actions, and future perspectives uh, of, of these institutions. Then we will have some time for discussions between participants uh, and the panelists. And then we will open the floor to the, to the audience so you can ask uh, questions to, to our panelists. So we want this to be very interactive. Don't hesitate to, to discuss between you when we finish the round of presentations. And for the attendees, I remind you that we have the on-air platform where you can ask questions there and we will collect them at the end of the presentations and read some of them to our panelists. So welcome again. We will start the presentations and now we will uh, give the floor to uh, Londa Shippengir who will start with her presentation. Thank you. Hi, I'm gonna share my screen. So here we go. And I think we're ready to go. Yeah, you, you all see that? Okay, good. So today I want to explore gendered innovations. Uh, my thing isn't changing, so what's going wrong? I need the next slide. Let me do it a different way. This I know works, so I'm just gonna go back to this old school. Okay, here we go. Um, we're going to explore gendered innovations. Gendered Innovations was produced through a large international collaboration, including the European Commission, the National Science Foundation in the US and Stanford University. We've now expanded into South Korea, South Africa, Japan, with some forays into Brazil and Argentina, not Colombia yet, we could think about that. And Gendered Innovations has brought together 200 basic scientists and gender experts in a series of collaborative workshops. New policies have been introduced in the European Union, Canada, and the US. And we've also started working with companies in Silicon Valley like Google and Apple. And at the end of my short remarks here, I'll take you to our website so you can see all the resources and cool stuff that we have there. So innovation is about integrating sex, gender, and intersectional analysis into the design of research. The operative question is, how can we harness the creative power of gender analysis for discovery? This is what you Europeans call the gender dimension. Does this approach um, add valuable dimensions to research? Does it take research in new directions? Now, I know your focus is on women. But it's important to understand that governments and universities across the US and Western Europe have taken three strategic approaches to diversity, to equality over the past several decades. One is to fix the numbers. I think that's your focus, to increase the number of women and other underrepresented groups in science, medicine, engineering. The second is to fix the institutions to make research labs and universities places where everybody's career can flourish. But I'm interested in fix the knowledge, which stimul stimulates excellence in science and technology by integrating sex, gender, and intersectional analysis into research. So all of these approaches together are important and one cannot succeed without the other. You're not gonna fix the numbers of women or underrepresented groups in science until you start integrating sex, gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status analysis in the knowledge itself. So let me just say it another way. There are three types of diversity. And I think you might find this article very interesting. There's team diversity, so the participation issue. There's the diversity of methods which brings into play what you all call the gender dimension or what we call sex, gender, and intersectional analysis. And then there's questions asked. If you ask new questions, you might in fact suck in, you might fix this problem by sucking in different participants. So it's not the causal direction of none of this is not clear. And we find that especially changing methods in your research increases the number of women and underrepresented groups. So my, my project, the Gendered Innovations, focuses on this third level, fixing the knowledge. 
it's the newest area and the most important for the future of science and engineering. And this is what Gendered Innovations is all about. So we focus, I'll take you to my website, we focus on developing state of the arts methods for sex and gender analysis. And now we also do intersectionality and we provide case studies, so examples to illustrate how these new methods lead to discovery and innovation. So I'm going to present a lot of these examples tomorrow in my keynote. And here I'll give you just a few to give you the flavor of what it is we're doing. So we know that doing research wrong costs lives and money. This has been the key example for a number of years 10 drugs were withdrawn from the US market because of life-threatening health effects, and eight of those 10 showed greater severity in women. This is very important because these drugs cost billions of dollars to develop, and when they fail, they cause death and human suffering. So personally, I never take a drug prescribed by my doctor unless I've studied whether it's been tested in women, in older people since I'm now older, or whatever my demographic might be. Did they see my biological situation? So we really can't afford to get the research wrong. So now let's take a few of the other examples and I wanna look at uh, medical devices. Programs and engineered systems often fail and fail more often for women and people of color. So medical devices harm more women than men um, according to the FDA, our Federal Drug um, Administration, women account for 67% of the 340,000 injured patients versus 33% of men. So if we take hip plant transplants, for example, overall hip transplants are very successful, but when they fail, they fail more often for women. Here you see women have a 29% higher risk of implant failure than men. And one reason for that is that women have these stronger immunological reactions to metal containing devices. And these reactions impact 49% of women, but only 38% of men. The female immunological system is really very interesting. So it's important to understand sex, biological sex differences at the physiological, molecular, and cellular levels. And this uh, Lancet article that just came out is a fabulous summary of basic sex differences in the body. If you do computational biology, you need to know about sex differences. My son does this and they were doing some cell thing forever and ever. I said, well, what about sex differences? And they found that sex inactivation was absolutely central to their project, which is now published in Cell. So for example, if you're going to bioprint a kidney in the next you know, decade or so, you need to know about sex differences in the kidney and in cells. The goal is to make a kidney that resembles the person's kidney completely so there's no rejection. So the goal is to seed the frame with the patient's own cells. But if that patient is female, you have to decide which of the X chromosome activated cells to use. And because of the complex X inactivation of females, the 3D bioprinted graph will never exactly uh, be a copy of the original kidney, which of course is the goal. So now gendered innovation, so those are all the problems, but we focus on solutions. And two solutions that are very important for any kind of computational work is checking your data sets. Are your data sets represent, representative? or like our GWAS, our genome-wide association uh, studies, include in the US 80% white people. Well, this is not going to tell you anything about the human population and may overestimate uh, people with African origins, may overestimate uh, you know, their risk of disease and, and cause a, a lot of problems. So one check here uh, developed by Timit Gebru is data sheets for data sets. And this allow, it's a tool for checking data sets that allows researchers to document exactly what is in the data set, how data were collected and annotated, 
what their recommended uses are, and so on. Now, in some instances, you cannot fix the data set. Say you're doing natural language processing and your data set is the corpus of the English language. Well, you can't fix it. Then you have to fix your algorithm. And there's so many solutions to algorithms. I simply chose this one that I like, multi-accuracy auditing. And what this does is allows for fairness and accountability of predictions um, for, so that the predictions will be fair for different kind of demographic groups in society. So they should be as fair for elderly Asian men as they are for young black women and that sort of thing. So um, I think that's great. And then we've summarized a lot of these solutions on our website, which I'll take you to now, um, in, in uh, especially our machine learning case study but we also have two nature articles. One is specifically on machine learning. And uh, the major article is this one in nature that appeared in 2019, sex and gender analysis improves science and engineering. So now let me take you just quickly to um, my website so that you can see all the great Okay, we don't really want to look at that this morning. <laughs> um, so on the website, we have methods. We have terms. If you don't know exactly what gender means, you can check in here. We have checklists. And then we have our examples, like the examples I've been giving you here in buckets. And you might be interested in this engineering one or the health and medicine one. Um, and these are examples of where considering sex and gender analysis add something to it. Gendering social robots is real interesting. I think haptic technology is very interesting. In each case, you have an abstract, you have a short little summary for journalists, and you have the full case study, which isn't very long. And what we want to say is if you're like, so this case study, for example, if you're creating a haptic device, there are all kinds of new haptics that are coming. You need to know something, and if you want that to interact with humans, you need to know something about human touch and what our unspoken social rules are about human touch. So here's one uh, article that we, I love this one. It, uh, it studies humans, it studies males, this is females and males in Europe, specifically uh, from Finland, the UK, France, Italy, and Russia. And the yellow part shows where you can touch someone else. And the black part is where you can't touch them. So if you compare females and males, you see that females, we can touch each other more than men can touch each other. We, there's more yellow in this whole thing than men. And then the intersectional aspect here is the relationship. So strangers almost can't touch each other. Okay, you can touch the hand, but the most of the body, you can't touch on the body of a stranger. Then you get to your family relationships and the females can touch the mothers more, that makes sense, but not the fathers. And then you get friends and you can touch them more and then partners, of course, you, you have full access to the body. So this is the kind of uh, intersectional approach we take. So in summary, I want to emphasize that there are three types of diversity. There's the team diversity, there's the diversity in methods, which is what we are all about, and there's the diversity in questions asked. And um, I think you are the people who can make this, who can integrate these new methods into your research. And I should say we've just finished a major project which we call Gendered Innovations II with the European Commission. And we'll be having 16 new case studies, which will be loaded up here, coming uh, later this fall. They haven't said exactly when it's coming, but you'll find them all on this website and also uh, on, the Euro on the European Commission uh, website under gender stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Londa, for this amazing presentation. I'm sure tomorrow there will be more. Uh, okay, so we continue with uh, Lucia. Uh, will you share your screen? Hi, everybody. Can you see me? Can you hear me? 
Yes. Well, um, my name is Lucia Peixoto, and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Biomedical Sciences at the College of Medicine at Washington State University. I'm a principal investigator. I lead my own lab. We do neurogenomics of development, sleep, and autism. But I'm also the co-chair of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee of the International Society for Computation Biology. And I'm here to talk to you about our initiatives as a society, as it turn as it pertains to equity, diversity, and inclusion. I'm not going to show you slides. I'm going to take you with me into a journey showing you some resources. I want this to be interactive. So hopefully there will be a lot of questions. Uh, feel free to use the chat, um, the live Q&A on, on air. Okay. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and take you with me to our resources. So uh, this is just the homepage for the International Society for Computational Biology. Uh, ECCB as a conference is an ISCB affiliated conference. And if you actually scroll to our global community section, you're gonna immediately see the equity, diversity and inclusion link. And this is the central hub for all our initiatives. It is ever expanding as we're open to feedback. So I wanna give you a little bit of history behind the committee. The committee was formally established at ISMB ECCB 2019 in Basel, but there were, the, it was the product of a lot of work from, uh, from a previously existing equity, diversity and inclusion task force. And we were charged with uh, creating policies and plans to increase equity and diversity and inclusion in the society because ISCB is committed to creating a safe and inclusive environment for all our members, right? And this is behind the idea, this is not just a woman's issue or a minority issue. This is an everybody's issues. So everybody benefits when the, the mindset is diverse. When, when it's not, we're missing out on a lot of great minds. So if you go to the website, you see that the first thing that you have is the points of our 2020-2021 EDI strategic plan. And that plan has five elements, and I'm gonna go a little bit through those elements. The first one is to increase social accountability for change in the society. The second one is obtaining data and developing measures to assess progress, and I'm gonna go back to that in a minute. It is really, really important to know where we stand, to, to know what we are doing progress. We have also developed voluntary training, which we call the ICB Awareness Toolkit. I'm gonna to show you that in a minute. There's a lot, of, a lot of what impedes diversity is bias. And a lot of that bias is not explicit, is implicit. And creating awareness really, really is helpful to that. And then we are slowly developing recruiting, recruitment and mentoring initiatives. So in terms of obtaining data, I wanted to show you a little bit of data behind uh, gender issues in the society and the society associated conferences. And as a full disclosure, this is data that was done using algorithms that infer gender, right? Because sometimes when we don't have the data, that's the only way to do it. In a minute, I'm gonna ask you to, you know, help us obtain the real data, right? So uh, I'm gonna go through this little figure over here, and I will post this link to the chat in a minute. What we have here in this figure is the estimated percent composition of male and female authors in the three leading computational biology journals. That is BMC Bioinformatics, Bioinformatics, and PLOS Computational Biology over time from 2000 until now, right? And what you see is that about only 20% of the authors are inferred to be female. What you have next to it is the percent of male, uh, infer male and female keynote speakers and fellows and keynote speakers on ISCB associated conferences. And in this case, this is ISMB and ECCB when it's joined together, PSB and Recom. One of the things that you see is that we are actually doing better than the journals in representation, which is good. However, we have a far way to go in terms to increase parity or equity. 
So there's two definitions here. As a society, we're, we're doing a relatively good job representing female speakers, but as a field, there's very few female authors, right? But this is infer gender, but it's more important to actually know the gender. Right? So currently in IECB, we have a pretty big initiative to improve this. So if you are an IECB member, this is how you can help us. You can go to my IECB and you can update your record. And this is all voluntary. We cannot, you know, ask people or force people to provide this information, right? And when you go to your membership record, you can actually, you, you, you're gonna be asked a lot of data of, about your gender, about your gender expression, which not necessarily matches your gender. We also got asked a lot of questions about ethnicity and this data is gonna help us know where we stand and where we go forward. The other thing that you're gonna ask, be asked is to acknowledge that you have read our code of ethics and professional conduct. And that also has been another great initiative of the society is that we have an official code of ethics and professional conduct that was released at ISMB ECCB 2019. You can go and read it here but we want all of our members to go through their membership records, read it and certify that you actually read it and acknowledge it and abide by it. And that's very important. So if we go back to our page, that is the ICB code of conduct. Together with the code of conduct, we created an initiative called a safe space, which is uh, um, intended to limit harassment we have allies that wear a ribbon badge on our meetings, that people that are trained so that people can feel free to approach them to report anonymously uh, breaches of the kind of conduct. We have recently released an ICB statement on, on countering social injustice in the light of all the recent turmoil, at least in the United States, in terms of social justice. Uh, the, other, the other initiative that is not directly here that we started in Basel is uh, child care. So uh, we, it was a very successful initiative. ISMB ACCB 2019 provided child care and all the members were really, really positive about this. And that is our strategic plan and our toolkit. So I'm going to take uh, the last five minutes or so to basically walk you very briefly through the strategic plan and how it came about. And then I will open this up for questions later. So you can go and see it, you can keep us accountable, but I wanna tell you a little bit about, about the thought that went behind it, right? We know that scientific work for diversity matters because it's a driving force of innovation. So we wanna counter bias and increase workforce diversity, but there's a lot of research about what works and what doesn't. So this is an ex extract from the Harvard Business Review. A lot of mandatory bias trainings do not work and they actually tend to produce backlash, right? So we, but, but what does work, right? So what works is establishing programs that engage individuals, our members in this case, in solving the problem, that expose people from different groups to each other. You know, this is a great event, the one we're here, we are networking, we're talking to each other. And then we need to encourage social accountability for change to engage people because they care about the issue, not because they have to do a bias training. So the components of those diversity programs that get results are voluntary training. We wanna focus recruitment on women in particular produces increases in diversity in all aspects. Isn't that interesting? I always found that very interesting. So based on this data, our strategic diversity leadership plan has those five components that I told you about. And now we have very specific 20, 20, 20, 21 action items that we want all our members to have, give feedback on. So I'm not gonna go through it in detail because you can go and take a look at it, but I wanted everybody to may, be made aware. And the ICD Awareness Toolkit is our call for voluntary training. So I'm gonna take just one minute to go through this. This is to actually help people counter their own biases. And one thing that is important to think about is that everybody has one. Saying, you know, telling that somebody has a bias is not a bad thing. I have one, we all have biases, right? But we are scientists 
and we can use a reason to actually counter that. So this toolkit has about five steps to try to minimize the influence of unconscious bias on scientific decisions. The first one is to actually take the implicit association test and find out what your bias is. It's really important. This is a really well developed, well studied uh, tool from Harvard. And once you sort of know what your biases are, you wanna be self-aware and frequently reevaluate your judgments. When you are reviewing an abstract for a conference, when you're reviewing a paper, when you are selecting speakers, I mean, are you really evaluating based solely on what is being presented? Do you use the proper language or do you, ex you know, if you use language that is actually exclusive of certain people? Have you assumed different research possibilities based on gender or maybe family responsibilities of the applicant? These are questions you have to ask yourself. So you won't have it. Then you want to inform yourself about your bias and then you want to help recognize it in others, right? So there's a resource section at the end that is ever expanding with a lot of lit good literature on bias and the impact of bias in science. The other thing about that, that I think is really important is that we change internal images of success for our trainees. So, it, it, and I actually uh, teach science to kindergartners sometimes. And it's this, it's this idea that, you know, how does a scientist look like, you know? And it's usually an old white male. But we all know extremely successful women, people of color, we have to make sure that we point this out to our trainees. So we wanna change the internal images of success as early as possible. And then you wanna be part of the solution. You wanna be a role model. You wanna use inclusive language. Language really matters. You wanna increase diversity to include underrepresented groups on your own team. So if you're a group leader, you have the power to do this on your own team. You wanna use your voice as a leader when you give seminars, when you go to conferences, when you use social media to support uh, underrepresented minorities in your profession, right? And the other important thing is to speak up when you observe bias, right? If you see bias being directed at somebody else, the person that that, that comment is directed to is pro probably not in a position to say something about it. But if, you, if, but if you can, if you can support it, you can make a change. So that is all I wanted to share for now. And I'll be happy to take any questions in the future. Um, and I'm gonna post this link on the chat. And thanks uh, everybody and Natalie and Bioinfo for Women for inviting me. Thank you, Lucia. Uh, okay, so we will move on to Maria Jose. So you can share your screen when you want. Yeah, thank you, Atia. I'm going to share my screen, okay. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, with good afternoon and thank you for to everyone for uh, coming uh, to this uh, breakout session and to share with us your ideas and your opinions and your experiences about women in science. I'm going to present you uh, the uh, BioInfo for Women uh, program from the Life Science Department at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. This uh, this uh, program started two years ago. It's quite a young program to promote gender equality and diversity uh, for having a better science, especially with a special focus in the transition from the postdoctoral to the junior independent positions. Uh, because we think that this is a delicate moment in the scientific career of uh, one person, especially for women. And then the question is, how can we promote gender equality? What activities uh, we develop to promote this gender equality and diversity? Then first we host young bioinformaticians at the BSc as visitors, as visitor scientists. We have in this uh, fellow program, part of the program, three uh, brilliant uh, scientists, Vera, Anais, and Milana. And they spend with us in the, at the BSc one month per year. 
participating in the research activities. Additionally, we also organize uh, and found coaching sessions for outstanding young PIs in bioinformatics. In this uh, coaching program, we have two uh, outstanding uh, PIs, Natasha and Marta Mele. Uh, we develop these uh, coaching sessions in uh, collaboration with other research institutions at Barcel in Barcelona, the CRG and the IRB. And at the end, the feedback that we collect from uh, these uh, five uh, women is that all of this is really, really, these activities are really useful for them to help them to create the uh, new groups and to consider, consolidate their positions in their institutions. Then we have these uh, activities that are uh, personal activities focused to, to, to one specific uh, scientist. We also organize a series of seminars to visualize the research work of young women. And also with, uh, to have the opportunity to develop collaboration networks with them. Up to now, we have uh, 25, around 25 uh, seminars already organized. The last one was uh, a virtual seminar because of this uh, COVID. And uh, the, the women that we invite, uh, she spends the full, uh, the full day, no, half a day with us. We organize for her also uh, different uh, meetings with the uh, groups in the department. We also have the seminar and we also at the end, we have a lunch with her to talk about the uh, problems that she has in the development of her career, scientific career, uh, good practices, uh, ideas and all of this. And then on to also together with these seminars, we uh, have organized uh, a conference last year uh, advances in computational biology that was in November in Barcelona with uh, the characteristic that all the organizers, uh, committees, chairs and speakers were women. We had more than 200 uh, people participating and coming from uh, more than 30 countries from all the uh, continents. In uh, the opinion of the uh, participants, it was a very inspiring conference. And uh, the opinion of 23% the of the participants was that this type of conference is absolutely necessary. As uh, here in, the, in this uh, breakout session, there are um, people that are organizing also a conference then I, I have to mention that uh, we have a special activity in the, in the conference that was uh, what we call meeting with uh, women leaders. And then uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this activity, we invite uh, eight women leaders, really women leaders, uh, as for example, the president of the Fujitsu in Spain, Latin America and Portugal, okay? and to share their experience and the knowledge for the development of a really successful professional career. Uh, then the participants have the opportunity to talk with them in a face-to-face -face, uh, way and to, uh, to, to know and be inspired by them. In the opinion of all the participants, the women, the lead, women leaders and also the, the the participants from the conference. It was really a wonderful experience. And I recommend you that to, to organize this kind of uh, activities, okay? Then, well, additionally to all these activities that are uh, oriented to the promotion of the women's scientific work, we also, as, as a program, we participate in activities organized by other uh, entities or organizations. Then we present the, the program, the BioInfo for Women program in, in different conferences. We have presented it up to now in six conferences. These activities are for dissemination and for established collaborations and networkings. 
We also participate in specific events that are for general public. In, uh, we participate in workshops, debates, presentations, and so on. And as a special uh, participation uh, case uh, uh, in, in the participation of uh, organization of other uh, entities, we have participated also in, this, in the organization of this uh, ECCB conference. Uh, given uh, the gender point of view to the conference. We also have organized the workshop, how to prepare, design, and deliver high input presentations, this breakout session, and also the uh, keynote of Londa that will be tomorrow, and uh, of course will be really, really interesting. And uh, I have to say that uh, don't miss this uh, conference, okay? Then I explain in a very fast uh, way the, um, the activities oriented to, for, to um, help and support the uh, women's scientific career. Okay? Then on top of this, in the program, we have a research line. Uh, the research topic is gender bias in computational biology, precision medicine, and artificial intelligence. This is um, in, in line of the work that Londa is doing, but of course we are just starting on, on, this, on this work. We have uh, published uh, one paper in Nature um, Digital Medicine. Uh, we are uh, writing a book that will be published uh, next year. And we have also organized uh, together in collaboration with La Caixa a series of um, sessions on uh, gender bias, health, and data science. These uh, sessions, our scientific sessions, are going to be uh, next year from January to May. And um, we have uh, <coughs> two, two, two track of sessions. One part of sessions are more oriented to the um, precision medicine, the bio problems, and uh, gender bias on, on, this, on this part of, of the problem. And the other track is more oriented to the computer scientists, uh, uh, the technical problems, and um, all of this. Then uh, I'm going. I, I invite you to participate in, this, uh, in these sessions. You probably will receive the invitation next year, okay? And then, uh, as I say at the beginning, the BioInfo for Women is still a very young program. We are growing. We have only two years uh, of, uh, of running. And we are looking for collaboration and participation. Because we think that if we, we, you really want to promote gender equality and diversity in science, it is necessary to join forces, okay? Then we invite you to participate with us in the, in the activities that we organize and uh, allow us to extend the program to in its activities, uh, to other research centers, to other countries, or in, we are open also to, um, to include other activities that uh, you think that uh, are interesting and can help women in their uh, professional career. Of course, you are most welcome. And thank you very much. Thank you, Maria Jose. Now we will move to the next presentation uh, with uh, Lucy and Ana Julia. Hi everyone. I don't know if, if you remember, but uh, first of all, I would like to present ourselves. And first, uh, I would like to thank for having us, for inviting us. So thank you, girls. It's uh, for us, it's an honor. Well, my name is Ana Julia Vélez Rueda. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I am actually working at the Structural Bioinformatic Group at the University of Quilmes. And we are here with Lucy to talk about our project in Latin America. 
Okay, thanks, Sana. As she said, uh, my name is Lucy Jimenez. I'm from Bogota, Colombia. And we are the founders and the co-organizers of this network, the Women, Women in Bioinformatics and Data Science in Latin America. So we met the last year at the Cabana workshop about chemical informatics and drug discovery in Irapuato, Mexico. And coming from our experience in the local Python communities from Argentina and Colombia, uh, we start to discussing about the importance of the open communities and the diverse communities aspect that, that mostly not taken into account in the local science communities. We realize that in Latam we don't have enough safety space to share and build these strong bonds with other women that are working in science. And it was in that moment that Anna came with the idea to create this amazing network. Uh, for sure, our perspective wasn't about a uh, simple intuition. We have some numbers and works that support our ideas. For example, we know from UNESCO service that globally only 35% uh, of STEM students in higher education are, are women. And the same tendency is observed when we are analyzing the proportion of women in science careers all around the world where women represent only 30% uh, of the population. So if we are going deeper into the analysis, we can observe that even when the partition of participation of women in science is almost at 30%, which seems to be not that bad, women are restricted in the access of the decision-making positions uh, by the glass ceiling effect. That is an invisible barrier that keeps women outside from position of power. So with a closer look at the situation in LATAM, the representation of women in size is higher with difference with the continent, but these numbers involve a deeper issue. It has been proposed that this is related to the lower salaries in science, and these lower salaries are usually reserved for women. Yeah, that's why um, we, we decided uh, to come up with this initiative and create the network of women in LATAM and working in bioinformatics and data science with a wide perspective. We believe it should include all the aspects that are important for the construction of a more equal and diverse society in which all women can feel safe, empowered, and can develop their careers without barriers. And because science is our, our environment, uh, it's our reality, and this is the place we, where we can make the difference. We, we came up with this conference and with this project. So the first conference, I don't know, Lou, if it is the next Wait. slide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> So we want to present you the, the first conference, which is a space to get women community together and make it grow and to know who we are and start feeling the power that sorority give to us. Yeah. So we are so happy with the positive response that the conference had. Right now, we have more than 600 registrations from, with people from more than 10 countries around the world. And we have a big network of women that is continually growing. So we are so happy for that. And as a Anna Awards, she says that it's not just about making visible uh, the women's work in science. It is also about generating networks, building communities, and promoting sorority. So thanks for, for inviting us. Thank you for, for listening. And please join us. And you are welcome to our conference.
Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for the space. Okay, thank you both for your nice presentation. So we will move to, the, to our last uh, speaker, uh, Jana. Uh, Jana, sorry, I don't pronounce it right. <laughs> Okay, it's Jane. Hi, okay. So, let me share my screen here. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, the opportunity to be here today. Um, it's really an honor to continue to share a little bit about the network and also just be a part of this super important conversation and just getting to see everyone here. Um, either I've interacted with you all on Twitter or have just seen all the awesome work that you do. And it's just really a blessing to see all of the parallels in, in the types of communities that we're building. So just excited to be here. Unfortunately, um, Taylor's unable to join us. Um, she's having internet issues. Um, but I will continue to highlight all of the work that she's doing as well to contribute as a member and really a star in CompBio. Um, so yeah, so today I'll share a little bit about um, the network and kind of who we are, the foundations of how we got started um, and really uh, hopefully open up the conversation um, from a lot of the, the topics that we've discussed as a community of um, navigating uh, the computational biology space as minorities, um, whether that's a double minority, so um, women, women of color in this space, or, or really um, trying to build networks and community um, and overcome some barriers. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Janae, and I'm currently a PhD student at Penn. Um, I'm interested in bioinformatics and cancer genomics, and I'm in the Jing lab there at um, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, and as a first generation student, something that was really important for me um, navigating the first year of my PhD was really connecting with um, other students and other um, scholars who um, not just study what I did, oh, not just study what I do, but um, really understand my perspective of being a Black woman navigating this space. Um, it was really difficult for me at first to find lots of people who looked like me um, in the field, but after basically just putting out um, some connections online on Twitter, um, basically getting together like a Google sheet of just people I could connect with and talk to um, in an informal way. We've kind of evolved from more than a group chat to an organization that's really focused on action and building global community and um, finding different ways to continue to engage with one another. And so our mission right now is to um, ampl amplify the voices and foster community amongst Black women in the computational biology field across the diaspora. And um, for right now, our goal is to um, build and foster a computational biology community that encourages and supports the active participation of, of Black women scientists across the diaspora at every professional level. Um, so a lot of um, the members in our network currently, um, we are a physical online networking platform. So we have a website and a way for people to communicate through Slack. Um, but most of us come from different backgrounds, ranging from bio to biomedical informatics or public health data science. We also have a lot of um, mathematicians and of course, people from physics and engineering. Um, so it's really awesome to have not only this diversity of backgrounds, but also um, the diversity of members. Um, we actually have a smaller number of undergraduates, but mostly graduate students and postdocs and, and faculty um, and indep independent researchers. Um, so that's really awesome and really contributes to um, the type of community we have. And so um, we also have an advisory board. Um, these are the amazing women who continue to drive and support the mission of the network, uh, basically um, supporting our collaborations, making sure that we are continuing to adhere to a lot of the mission and vision that we're putting forth, but they really provide um, lots of expertise and skills. So um, special thank you to Tracy Johnson and Niyata Chambwe and Stacey Finley and Casey Overby-Taylor. Um, they are advisory board members for, for this year. 
So um, thinking about how we continue to move forward this mission of amplifying the voices of Black women in the field, um, I consider this to be compartmentalized into about five overall different areas of, of how we continue to, to evolve as an organization focused on engagement. Um, so there's a lot of parallels. I think there is um, scientific enrichment. I think the last speaker mentioned, um, and I think that really aligns with um, research, resource amp amplification. Um, oftentimes when you are the only woman maybe in your lab or even the only black woman, um, there's sometimes social barriers that kind of leave us out of the informal networks that include us into things like study groups or um, working groups um, on progress on projects and things. And so really trying to amplify resources like training modules, workshops, um, ways to continue to get involved and build skills, um, but also providing that environment to do so as a community is something that's important for us. Um, science communication, we have, a, we have a partnership actually with PLOS Computational Biology, um, at the members of the journal there who um, continue to work with us to provide a platform platform for continuing to engage the comp bio community through um, upcoming editorials and things like that, but also um, working with people in the network who are really interested in writing and um, building those scientific skills. Um, and so that's really important for us, not only through that collaboration, but we do have a blog on our website and that in the future we're working on content there for um, tips for applying to graduate school and the per perspective of being a computational biologist in this area and kind of how to navigate that. Um, so science communication in that way is also a central part of our community. Um, intergenerational collaboration, I already mentioned that we have members from different stages of um, the, the, their careers. So having a, a place where there's faculty, postdocs and senior scientists, as well as undergrads and early grad students is really makes for a really special environment for um, contributing to a tiered mentorship a framework there and um, within the community. Um, so critical scientific engagement, of course, we like to talk about and we will continue to emphasize the science that we do. So um, and things like our um, seminar and workshop series are really highlighting black scientists um, overall right now um, in the field and really continuing to provide in a, a comfortable environment to talk about science and really spark innovation and inspire um, collaborations on that front. And then, of course, everything we do is through a global citizenship perspective. So um, we have members from literally all over the world, um, several different countries in Africa, um, other continents. And it's really important for us to realize that we can work together across the diaspora and possibly do things um, where we are now to, to really influence our communities on a local and global scale. Um, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about our members, you can go onto our website, onto our connect page there. We now have 110 members um, from across the world who um, come from, again, so many different backgrounds and you can click on these profiles and go to their LinkedIn and personal websites and things like that. But all of these people are super amazing and they contribute in so many different ways to the, the wonderful community that we're building. So I do encourage you all to, to learn more about our members there. Um, another part of our, um, I guess, our discourse in the community is really focusing on what it means to have a seat at the table or what does it mean um, to be inclusion or liberation focused. Oftentimes we think of the seat at the table narrative as, you know, having some sort of influence within some sort of corporate setting um, and being able to have the power to make decisions somewhere. But I think what is really powerful and what I try to challenge people to do is challenge the narrative of not trying to belong or trying to fight for belonging in an environment that may or may not have been created um, to include us in the first place. So I think what's important for us to, to, to talk about is um, like how can we dismantle the table or how can we create something that everyone from the beginning feels included in um, and continues to, to build a framework for, for sustainable change um, and really building an environment where, where people can, can thrive and not just survive and, and bring their whole selves to the table. So that's kind of the underpinnings of a lot of the philosophy that drives us. And I think, you know, through our community that we'll, we build, we don't just, you know, benefit ourselves as Black women within the network, 
through collaborations with allies and other um, um, communities and other organizations and you know things like POS, um, we benefit everyone and we ultimately benefit and work together to advance the entire Combio community. And so that's what's important to me and that's what um, motivated me to, to put the, you know, the effort into to building this community um, and what we hope to focus on in the future. So if I was Taylor, I would be here um, saying um, that she is really an awesome um, contrib a contributor to, to our community. Um, she's currently a PhD student at Cornell and she's interested in plant genomics um, but she helps us on one of our initiative boards, which I'll um, touch on later, which is bringing in and really finding ways to curate um, conversations in CompBio and, and involve Black women in the broader computational biology conversation through our seminar workshop series. She also helps with grad school resources and basically is just a star there. Um, but one of the reasons she highlighted um, joining the community was that it was a place to be seen, heard, and supported. Um, and coming from backgrounds in physics and mathematics, um, which are highly homogenous, mostly white male, um, she feels um, represented here. She feels seen and she feels like she can see herself in the community, which is important and actually something that a lot of people um, shared with us. And um, we all have mentors who are really important to us and advisors um, who really um, advocate for us and demonstrate allyship. But there's a certain gap that's filled there when the people that can do that um, are people that look like you and understand the intersections of your identity in a really unique way. And so in this way, um, hope it, it provides hope that's really powerful and, and empowering, empowering for us as scientists to move forward. And something that's you know, important for us to remember as we continue to work together um, this way. Um, so I just wanted to highlight in my last two slides um, some of the conversation that we had at our first meet and greet. Um, I have highlighted a lot of this in the earlier talks I've given at ICB and things, but I think they really pertain to the conversation that um, I'm hoping we have today in terms of how can we continue to support women in the field and how can we um, realize and, and recognize the areas for collaboration when it comes to building an intersectional perspective on diversity um, equity and inclusion efforts in the field. And so um, we had basically just asked um, some members, do you feel supported as a Black woman in your field? And most people um, said that um, whether or not they were in academia or out of it, um, that particular environment may or may not have been the most um, conducive to their learning style or their growth professionally. And so um, most people now with a lot of the conversation, especially on social media and, and things like Twitter, um, where there's a, an increase in amplification of Black voices in STEM and conversation about how to support um, Black scientists and maybe not just scientists, but academics in the ivory tire, tower as a whole. Um, I think now there's a lot more attention being paid to um, stories that are being told and real experiences that are being lived in a really unique way um, and continuing to, to push forward those efforts for communication um, globally on such a broad platform is something that's been um, really important in trickling down into academic spaces. Um, so that's one thing. Um, more people cited that um, allyship can come in different forms, but sometimes um, when people maybe don't understand how to be an ally, um, you can go from feeling advocated for and supported to kind of feeling like a target or a spokesperson for everyone in your minoritized group or feeling like you have to speak for or uh, become a diversity and inclusion um, representative for, for everyone in your, your community. Um, and sometimes um, when we're in those smaller lab settings and we are the only black woman or woman in general in that space, you can quickly turn into um, to that type of target. And so kind of understanding the dividing line between how to be an ally and how to support and uplift without um, pinpointing and um, putting people on the spot um, when they are, when, they, when it's easy for them to feel tokenized in that setting. Um, I wanted to actually get to this one. Um, I think it really, 
better highlights a lot of the, the barriers on a global scale of um, maybe coming from a um, developing country or coming from a country where you're no longer um, a minority in that setting, specifically because we have such a strong membership coming out of various countries in Africa. Um, what happens when everyone in your Count Bio program is actually already a Black person, um, but there's a disconnect there where everyone around you is studying this highly academic space, um, but there is a disconnect in terms of incorporating a lot of that cooperation and um, uplifting those people on the global scale um, after they come out of those really um, awesome programs. Um, why is that? And why is it that there's still a barrier of if you have a degree or qualifications from a certain area of the world that doesn't necessarily translate to other places um, that provide even more um, opportunities for engaging scientifically and professionally. Um, so those are some of the, the topics that we discussed there. Um, and then finally, um, ways that we continue to, to work towards um, these and kind of tackle these issues is we have three initiative boards or I guess subcommittees. Um, the Pathways to Computational Biology Board is basically focused on highlighting no matter what career stage you are, where you are in the country, um, ways that you can um, get into the field of computational biology, contribute and really feel supported and find mentorship in that way. So now we're working on resources for applying to graduate schools in the UK, US, Canada, um, places like that, and working on your personal statement and letters of reference. So we're starting small here, but it's really going to turn into a larger platform for sharing those resources. And then um, we have a seminar and workshop series, which is highlighting Black scientists in general in the field. Um, through workshops and small science talks for just providing a better environment for talking about science. Um, and then communicating our science actually is just a focus on highlighting, highlighting our members in the science that they do and the research that they're working on and just really providing um, a, a space to, to spotlight so many of the awesome people in, in the network. Um, so we're working on doing that on a scale of about 100 people in several different countries. So thank you all for your patience um, today. This is actually a really awesome uh, screenshot from our first uh, virtual meeting. Um, so if you'd like to learn more, feel free to head to our website. Um, you can actually scan this code to go to our website and find us on Twitter here. And um, Taylor is also on Twitter, but you can also find her on our website for more information. Um, but yeah, thank you for your time and really looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. So uh, just to remind you, you can ask questions on the owner platform uh, and we will handle them. Or if you want, you can also raise your hand here in Zoom and we can open the mic. Uh, so for now, we have uh, one question from Lucia to uh, Lucy and Ana Julia. I don't know if you want to ask it yourself or I may read it. Um, uh, may, may you read it, please? I don't Yes, yeah, so I can read it. I can ask it since I yes, asked. Yeah. Yes. So I was just wondering um, so, how, if you're planning to um, make your initiative more of a global community initiative to include Latin American researchers working in the United States or in Europe, or is it meant to just, you know, empower uh, women within Latin America? So, how global is the meeting and where do you want to go in the future? Well, actually, we have uh, invited Shoshana Bodak. We, we, uh, she is a very great and amazing researcher working actually in, in Belgium. And she will be invited to our conference. But we are is starting this project and we are trying to 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 join and to meet all the, the women working in Latin America. But yeah, our idea is to spread <laughs> and to make contact with other communities. We, for us, we think that it is the, the most important thing to create networks, real networks in which we can collaborate and we can share our work. And actually we have in this, in this, in this group, in this uh, 
a community that we have created uh, a lot of researchers uh, sh uh, they are working with us uh, equally working uh, like Cristina Marino and Georgina Stegmaier they, they are researchers and they are li uh, leader groups so uh, they are helping us a lot with uh, with connecting other researchers around the world and we have uh, uh, very good reception in, in Barcelona also and in Spain with a lot of uh, researchers that uh, are there to help us. So yeah, the, the, the idea, the original idea is kind of spreading and, and trying to make this network grow. I don't know if I have answered. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't know if someone from the audience wants to ask something, otherwise I, I have some questions for you. L Londa one, wants to make a question. Yes. Okay, yeah. Um, I have a question for Lucia. Um, I liked your, all of your tools, but I was a little worried about how you were collecting the sex and gender categories. Did you work with some sociologists on that? Because you had gender and then you really had sex categories of male and female. And we put sex at birth, if you really wanna know like what's your sex at birth. And then for the gender categories, we have a number of them. Uh, like you had cisgender, but then you, I, I couldn't see your categories. So we have a lot of gender fluid or non-binary or gender queer. I mean, you know, are you collecting all that kind of stuff? Uh, thanks, Wanda. Uh, yes. So, and, and this particular, uh, it's amazing how just five little questions on a survey actually took about four months to talk about that. And, and we also uh, talk with people that identify to in different groups, right? So w the most important part is all this information is voluntary, right? So we want pe to make people comfortable disclosing this information. So what what is out there now may not be perfect, but it was the best compromise. Uh, and, and I think to us, the important part was, you know, reach out to people that may actually choose all the choices, right? So the, the ethnicity part also took quite a bit of discussion. Oh, and, yes. And, and, and so, and make sure that they are comfortable selecting. And all the options have preferred not to declare also, because mm -hmm. you may be able, you may be more comfortable maybe disclosing your ethnicity, but you do not want to disclose your gender identity. There's also a different part in which we are talking about disabilities, but it's actually in a, in a different page because it pertains also to technology that we may want to use to accommodate. So yeah, so it was about a fourth month back and forth within the committee and, and testing. And so we do have, we ended up, we used to have all of those two, gender and identity together. And, and then we realized that it's just better to split them up. And, and there are all the options, including, you know, I prefer not to identify in, in each of the categories. Now, one of the things that I wanna say is that because this is voluntary, right now we only have about a 15 to 20% participation, right? Which makes it really hard for us to infer general things about a society. Right? But the idea was that people will feel comfortable making a selection. And mm -hmm. um, because it's in your membership record, it's tied to your identity. So that makes yeah. it a little bit tricky, right? Yeah. So I wonder, uh, the, the inferred gender tool you used, I recently used it for an article, and I think it's unethical, and maybe it should be not used anymore. I wonder what your opinion is. So this is not an article that I researched. This is a research, uh, this was done by a group leader that is also a member of the ADI committee. If you go to the that page, which is completely open to suggestions, by the way, so go to the page and make that comment, right? There was a lot of discussion about which tools to use to infer gender, also to infer ethnicity, which is even you, Well, you really can't infer ethnicity. I mean, that's-, okay. that's so, so it is open. So this is, the, the article is open to suggestions, right? Mm -hmm. 
and and so the issue that we have here is that we do not want to do that however we cannot get data if only 15 percent of people actually respond so we cannot get action right? yeah. and so we somehow really we have to get the ball rolling right we reinforce a lot of gender bias if we use these tools that people are trying to create but they just they're, they're just not they're not i don't think they're ethical actually so anyway yeah. But I'll encourage you to go to the page of the article, which is open, and make the suggestions. But it's a catch-22, right? How can we make change if we don't have data? You know, eventually we want to replace it with real data, but we need people to disclose it. We can force people to disclose this information. So all of these issues are, you know, tricky. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, there are always these kind of trade-offs in this uh, when you're researching. So we starting to have some questions from the audience. Let me read some of them. So the first one would be from Davide Shirilo. He says, uh, if considering sex differences in clinical research and drug development has now largely proven cost effective and socially beneficial, what does retain big pharma to fully embrace the change? Perhaps the difficulties related to targeted patient recruitment for the clinical trials? Someone wants to answer this? Well, um, hi, Davida. <laughs> I'd be happy to answer this. Um, I, well, I think uh, now we have so many things which are getting to the sex analysis in medicine. Like the NIH in the US requires that everyone look at sex as a biological variable. So you do not receive public funding unless you do your sex analysis in a responsible way. So tax dollars should not be invested in bad science. So I hope that, and I know the Canadian Institutes for Health Research also has such a requirement. The European Commission also has such a requirement. We just need all of the uh, biological, medical, and health funding agencies to ask for this sex as a biological uh, variable so that we get the research right. Then, and we're working with NIH right now, we have to take the next step to look at gender as a sociocultural variable. And NIH has not embraced that yet because we need better tools. And we've just submitted a paper, the Gendered Innovations Group plus other people have just submitted a paper uh, with a gender variable tool that we hope will help people with this. So pharma, you know, we, you can, you can publicly funded organizations have a responsibility to the entire population. Pharma is their companies, so they don't. So I'm not sure how we encourage them more to do this. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, thank you, Linda. David, yeah. Okay, so uh, I can, I add, can I add something to that? And this is sure. just a thought. Yeah. So um, I think it's also important to have people on the leadership that advocate for this. This is the same, you know, I'm in a medical school and you're, you're talking about issues of this, right? So it's not an issue unless somebody raises it, right? So you will think that the monetary issue will be enough, but somebody has to sit at the table. This goes back to what Jenea said, sit at the table and says, well, you should be paying attention to this and it cannot just be one person. So this is one of the reasons why sitting at a table is so important, right? Because I, I, I mean, there's several examples in which decisions are made that just don't make sense, right? But, but they do make perfect sense for the group of people that are making the decision, right? So this is why representation matters. Well, I think there's even one further element to this. All medical schools, and they don't yet, all medical schools should be incorporating sex and gender analysis and ethnic and race analysis into the curriculum. I think it may be criminal that we don't have these aspects in the curriculum because all students, medical students especially, should be learning how it's life-saving to understand these things and how you can actually harm people if you don't understand them. 
And there we need the dean. We need the leadership in the dean's office. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I will read another question from Maria Morales, and she says, uh, a priori, it seems easier to detect these biases when we are investigating with population data, but what can we do when the data from your experiments are more abstract and come from databases in which the origin of this data is not well tagged, are considered common for both gens, or even we do not have the knowledge to evaluate the algorithm that we use. Do you have any advice? Is that for me? Uh, it's general, they didn't put any, but yeah, go on. Else wants to answer. Yeah, if you, if you want to answer, please go on. Well, if someone else has an answer, I would love to hear it. Um, the thing is you can't use data that you that hasn't been labeled correctly. We have so many examples now of how if you use poor data, you you know, bad stuff in, bad stuff out. So you really need to use these data sheets for data sets that was developed by uh, Timnit Gebru. Uh, she's now at Google. She was at Microsoft Research before. These are very serious things and you need to know where your data came from. Then if your algorithm is a black box, there are different, there are many solutions you can take now to see um, what the difference would be. I recommended one, you can look at our nature paper. I didn't write that section. James Zoe here in computer science and biodata wrote that section. Um, so you need to find ways to test your outcome to see if it's going to be fair. So it's not enough to say, you know, throw your hands up. Oh, I can't do it. You've got to find ways to do it. Otherwise, you're just reinforcing bias and you're going to harm people. The problem is if you're in a medical field, you're going to harm people or you will not enhance their health. Thank you for the answer. Okay. Okay, I think we can continue. So we have another answer, another question, sorry. Um, that is more general. Uh, is there any PhD funds for women from low income countries? Um, maybe Lucy or the other association could answer if you know. No. Sorry. Here in Latin America, uh, I think that we have kind of um, pri priority, you know, in in the common and common. Uh, fellows but I, I now I don't remember one in particular which could be just for for women not in Latin America but Europe I, I know that that you you will remember some for example Marie Curie I, I think that they have some some fellows for especially for women um, maybe yes, just in Maybe yeah. I, I didn't know here in Colombia, but I know that the L'Oreal sponsorship maybe have something for for, for yeah. women in general, but not just here in Colombia. Uh, there are also uh, the organization for women in science for the development world that have a different funding uh, connected with the Elsevier. Uh, I think so. We can share later the information. Um, I don't know, Atia is here, is connected. So, Atia has disappeared. No, yes, I'm, I think it's not connected. So we have another general question about uh, the COVID. Uh, how 
how the impact of COVID crisis of women's science affect and the, or change the point of view of your association uh, institution right now? If you have different uh, things that you right now think of, about how women is affected. I don't know, the ECCB or maybe. I have not the figures of the, for this uh, impact of the COVID. I don't know. The other day, Lucia Peixoto was talking about this. I don't know if she has the figures of how was the impact. And uh, not only uh, on, the, on the papers that were published, but also in the uh, projects that uh, funding projects presented by women and so on. But uh, uh, I have there is an impact, but I do not have the figures for it. Was, the question I was more about uh, if you have different uh, uh, activities or you think uh, different uh, opportunities to give because women are right now are very affected and minorities. So I don't know if Shania wants to say something. Yeah, um, so a lot of um, the community already was already meeting virtually just because we're all over the place. But um, a focus definitely now in the programming is just continuing to create space for um, exchanging self care resources or just more casual conversation and opportunities to connect and network. Um, especially, um, we're getting ready now to kind of break up the network into like more regional pods. Um, so since we have like an Africa contingent of um, Europe and the North and South America, and really just um, programming, programming um, ways for peer mentorship opportunities there. Um, I think just those small community, community building, I guess, efforts have gone a really long way, um, especially um, just given the diversity of you know, a lot of our members coming from so many different backgrounds um, and also dealing with this in so many different ways, um, especially at least in the US since um, the pandemic has started. I mean, I guess the, the pandemic has been, um, the focus of a pandemic has been on COVID, but there's also the pandemic of um, racism and a lot of the uprising and a lot of um, unsettling there. So kind of having to deal with that and um, navigate that space, um, just providing opportunities to talk about it and, and let go of a lot, I think has been um, a, a plus for a lot of us and just finding community there. Um, so. Thanks. Okay, the other question that we have is, what is the impact of gender stereotype in the workplace? Someone want to answer this general? That's a hard one. Right? <laughs> I just, I wanted, I actually, I was searching for something I wanted to share just briefly related to the previous um, um, question, and then I'm gonna give my thoughts on that. <laughs> These are my personal thoughts. They are not the ISCB thoughts, okay? But, so I wanted to share this because this was actually um, published in JAMA, uh, and I think it's an important for people. I will post the link on um, on the chat. So there is some data showing that co the COVID pandemic has a, had a huge impact on the the manuscript submission by women in particular, um, and uh, so. To that women are uh, submitting last articles as first and senior offers, right? And uh, meaning that, and this was, or there was already sort of a gap, right? And so, but this means that the COVID pandemic can widen that gap, right? And what I was talking to Maria Jose the other day is that the actual data on the number of total submissions of proposals, grant proposals to the National Institute of Health has actually increased in the last two submission rounds. 
So you have more submissions and somehow women are submitting less manuscripts. So there's no data yet in terms of NIH submissions in terms of gender, right? But my concern is this is a bad trend going forward, right? So this is the, the JAMA article talking about this, the impact of COVID on manuscript submissions. Um, yes, and I'll, there's a lot of, so it's not like people exactly know why this is happening. This can be associated by probably with caregiving responsibilities, which brings me to stereotypes because, uh, uh, Right. So, so there, there are a lot of stereotypes associated with any kind of difference, I will say. <laughs> and, and, you will, and one of the things that I've seen is that because the number of graduates, female graduates in particular, so I'm not going to talk about sort of my intersectional experience right now, um, has uh, increased, you tend to encounter those biases a little bit later than you used to, right? So, so when I was a PhD student, I had a lot of female colleagues. I didn't feel any different when I was, and I also did my undergraduate degree in Latin America. I'm originally from Uruguay. Um, and so, but I didn't really feel the fact that I was different from the majority until I was into my postdoc and definitely as a principal investigator, right? So, so the bias, so it, the bias, the, the presence of bias is proportional right, to, to sort of the differences in your environment, right? You are much more likely to be a target to a bias if you're the only person that looks a certain way or speaks a certain way or behaves a certain way. It's not just about looks, right? And, and so in terms of women, sort of one of the things that is, you know, you know, this is computational biology. This is, there's this pervasive bias that women don't like math. I've encountered that really, really early. I started programming and doing some stats with my dad when I was 12, so I encountered that. But I didn't really feel that very much as a PhD student going to ISMB almost every year. But once you are in your postdoc and you're definitely you know, one of the minorities, then you start feeling that more and more. I really encountered a lot of bias when I ha had my first child. So I was the first woman to have a child in my postdoctoral lab that was a definite bias, you know, if you have children, you don't care about science, right? So, so, so the, the presence of bias and what you encounter is proportional to your environment. So it's, it's relative, right? On the other hand, if you educate about the biases, it's, you're less likely to encounter them, right? So this is, you have to be proactive about it, right? Sorry, can I say something? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, no, I think that we can't, we can observe or we, we can't analyze this uh, science uh, like a, a out of the world thing, you know, we are part of a society, we are part of a patriarchal society and so the impact will be in each action we we are taking uh, you know we women have a, a lot of barriers to to access to education and to science and we are fighting all day with a lot of kind of my, micro machisms and so this impact of course, in science, because if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't feel safe, if you don't feel empowered, you won't raise your your voice. You won't raise, you know. So I think that this this question is um, we we can't analyze uh, this the science without a gender perspective. I think that life should be analyzed with this perspective uh, and. That's why if, I think that only taking into account the the papers or the publishing or the research that we are leading is kind of uh, having a, a, a I don't know a bias in, into the analysis. You know, we are part of a society, so and we have a political role, role in which we have to discuss this. If, if scientists uh, don't discuss this kind of problems, this, this kind of issues, the general, we are part of the problem, I think. So 
it's not only about science and technical aspects and not only about publishing or not. It's just part of a big problem. And it's, I think that we have a big responsibility to, to talk uh, about this, this problem as a general problem. And we are part of the society. So we have all these this, this issues to, to solve as a micro zone of a society, you know? Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry for missing uh, a part. I had a, a problem. Um, okay, so there is one last question that I would like to mix a little bit with another thing and do kind of a last round. Uh, so each of you have the opportunity to, to say your, your last words, let's say. So this question is uh, about what would you advise to your male peers that want to reinforce the role of women in computational biology uh, without taking the uh, leading role. And I would also like to add, uh, which, uh, what would you advise also to, to girls, to the next generation of girls that want to, to study these fields and how to engage them to do that? So maybe we can do in the same order of presentations and we start with Londa, like one, two minutes uh, round presentation about that. Thank you. Uh, you're muted, Londa. You are on mute, Londa. We don't hear Sorry. you. Sorry. How long are we going? I thought this ended uh, after an hour and a half. Uh, we now to wait to close the session. It's the last round. Just oh, to... okay. And sorry, what did you want me to talk about? Uh, so, what would you advise to your male peers that want uh, to to promote the role of women in computational bio, and also uh, for future generation of girls that want to to start this career? Well, you know, my interests, well, so males, uh, the gendered innovation has always worked very hard to have at least 40% men involved in our case studies and all of our work because they need to learn at the same time that we're learning. So we always involve, and I directed the uh, Stanford Institute for Gender Research, and we always had men involved. Um, and right now, the director of that is a man. We need, we, everybody needs to be involved. This isn't something just women can do. I was glad to see Davida here. I mean, uh, but the rest of us seem to be, well, here's a hobby, right? Uh, you know, we need to include the men as well. And that will, a lot of these people are going to have daughters and sons, and we need to raise our daughters, sons, and our gender fluid children to you know, to uh, be supportive of everybody. It, it starts in the womb. That's what I always say. Equality starts in the womb. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lucia? Hi. So I think I want to second what Londa said. This is not a woman's issue. This is a diversity issue. Everybody loses when like half of the voices are not being heard. Right. And, and so I just want to encourage people to go to the ICB awareness toolkit and read point number five, how to be part of the solution. And this is not, you know, gender specific, right? The first thing is that you want to be a role model whenever, if you are in a position in which you can make a decision, make sure that you empower people equally, right? And if you have a voice as a leader, you know, talk about it. But the other thing that is really important that I found important for me is that speak up when you observe bias. If you're in an interaction, and, and this happens very often in certain contexts, and you see, for example, a woman try to make her point out cross and getting constantly interrupted, or saying something and not being heard, and then somebody else repeated it and getting the credit, speak up and said, no, so-and-so did that idea, or can you please let her speak? You know, that is a way, and, and that is on the context and is not just for gender, right? So that's how you're part, you, when you are in a group that is majority, right? Then you have the power to influence that by actually pointing out the bias. And it doesn't have to be abrupt, right? So it doesn't have to say, oh, you have bias. Point is like, oh, well, can, can she talk please? Or, oh, you know, that idea, 
she said it a little bit ago. So those are two very common scenarios, by the way, <laughs> right? This is how you can do that. So, and you know, raising your own children, of course, you know, I have a boy and I have a girl, right? And, and you know, what you project to them, how you talk about other people, it's really important. But that is gonna take a lot of time. In your immediate work situation, if you see a situation like that, just speak up, point it out. Be aware of those biases and point them out to other people if they don't see them. Thank you. Uh, Maria Jose? <clears throat> well, I, 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 I agree with uh, Lucia. I think that all of us, we have bias, gender bias, okay? Uh, sometimes against men. Women have bias against men. If men have to take care of the children, then, then we, uh, we say, okay, no, we do better, we do better this, this, this kind of work, okay? Then for, for the, uh, the, the, the professional work, uh, the only advice I can do is that uh, everybody has to work with the responsibility and developing a, a professional work and trying to think on this, on, on, on the professional work, on not, and not on who is the person who is developing this work. And is, this is valid for men and for women. It's, it's the only way. And, and then it's a, it's a question of education. You have to educate your, your children in, in the, to avoid these bias, but be conscious that you already have bias. Okay? I, I know that I have bias, okay? Even I don't want to have them, but uh, I'm conscious of this. This is the only thing, the, the only advice that I, I can do, okay? I can give. Thank you. So now it's the turn of Lucy and Ana Julia. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I, do you I, want I to start? start? Yes. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so I think that it's important to stay informed. <laughs> oh, great. what is that? <laughs> Support the, the other women's initiative, create this inclusive environment and be actively inclusive person and a, a empathic person with the others. I think that is important. And generate more, more roles, models for the others. Yeah, and I think, I, I think that I agree with, uh, with, with all it was said, but I think that we have to reinforce the, the 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 thing that we have to to educate ourselves by studying and forming us uh, with a gender perspective we have to to study you know how how uh, like we study science we should uh, read more about gender and and so we can uh, find answers or maybe another perspective to, to analyze the reality and um, reanalyze our, our actions. And I think that that's the clue uh, for, for, uh, for everyone, uh, for gain in, in quality, you know. Yep, thank you. And last, Zanai. Yeah, so um, I think a lot of the points made were really important. I think a particular perspective that is unique to our organization is that um, we definitely consider um, a, an intersectional perspective from um, both race and gender and how that plays into our immediate environments and how um, we can promote and kind of recruit allyship that's not just focused on gender, but also um, race in, in kind of uplifting those voices and kind of dismantling kind of two um, coordinating oppressive systems sometimes. And so I think um, for us, um, really empowering the next generation of, of computational biologists is, for me, I would say is continue to use your voice um, and, and continue to find that type of community, um, either within yourself or within people that can look like you and can advocate for you in that way. Um, but I think that also includes really not just recruiting allies, you know, slapping on the name of ally to any and everyone that wants to be of help, but educating um, allies on what allyship actually is and actually the first step is not doing, it's listening. 
And it's really thinking critically about, okay, am I allowed to take space here? And what does it mean if I take space here? What does it mean for me to advocate? And how do I do that? And I think, you know, sometimes we can, you know, conflate allyship with advocacy and just support. And I think definitely it's time to be a little bit more conservative with the definition of allyship there. But there's always an opportunity, um, and especially in everything that we do, um, for, for allyship and continuing to amplify, you know, voices, Black voices um, of all genders um, in everything that we do, um, but especially um, use, utilizing allyship as a tool and as a, as a community building um, a tool at that. So, yeah, lots of, lots of things that play at once, but definitely um, important conversations. So, thanks everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, this is the end. I would just like to thank you all for joining the session and especially to thank the panelists for giving these inspiring talks and, and the discussion. And also to the organization and especially Natalie and, and Eva who replaced me with when I had this technical problem. So, yeah, I just want to thank you all for making all this possible and wish you a good day or afternoon, depending on where you are. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye. bye.